high praise. That's a high praise, and more importantly, it's a praise that God is worthy of. Yes? Yes. Thanks be to God that we have gathered one more time, never in the same way, and yet the same God. Um, it is good to be with you all this Transfiguration Sunday. Uh, Transfiguration, some might say, huh, what? Uh, well, hopefully we'll remember, reclaim uh, the significance of that moment in time in the life of Jesus and the disciples. And what I'd like to ask for you to do today is to really be present uh, just for a bit to pause and to remember that we are indeed in worship and God is speaking, not me, because you can tune me out, but be sure and invite God to speak to you during this worship so that we might remember why we're even here that we might reclaim why we even worship. And so this morning I ask that we would not forego the opportunity, the privilege to join in what God has done, what God is doing, and what God is yet to do. Because indeed the text today is exactly about what has been done by God, what is being done by God this very day, and our hope of what is yet to be. I invite you as you're able to stand in the reading of the Gospel of Luke. Luke, the ninth chapter, beginning with verse 8, as you're able, please stand for the reading. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I have chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. This is God's word for us, God, his children. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. God, you have, are, and will continue to speak. God, I pray that as I've listened, that what I will share, God, will be pleasing to you. I pray, God, that as we continue in our time of worship, God, that you would uh, just continue to move in and through our very being, that something, something would be changed 
unto your likeness in each of us in deeper ways this day. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So the text that was read today is Luke the ninth chapter. And I am reminded that very little happens that is new right there in the moment. More often than not, there is a backstory to pretty much every thing that we are a part of in this life. And oftentimes we fail to know the backstory. Oftentimes we fail to recognize the importance of what has been so that we can gain a deeper understanding of what is. And this text today, the transfiguration, has a significant backstory. And so I'd like to move back a little bit to bring us to the text for today. For you see, Jesus' journey didn't begin on the mountaintop. I look at verse chapter 4 in the Gospel of Luke. And it brings us to Jesus in the wilderness. Jesus' ministry took a hard hit in the wilderness. Some might look at it and wonder, how did he make it out? Well, the great news is he did. He was hungry and he survived. He had no possessions and he survived. And some might say that that was Jesus. He was capable of all of that. Jesus did it to teach us. Let us not forget that. And there were no disciples there with him. Jesus was alone. There's a lesson for us to be learned that we're not going to always have the luxuries of life. We're not going to always have people there with us. And yet we are called to be who God has created us to be and to do what God has equipped us to do. And so as we move forward in this particular uh, uh, book of the Bible, Luke, we see that Jesus, after coming out of the wilderness, he goes to a place where he just knows that they're going to throw a party and be happy to see him. Nazareth, a place that should have opened their arms wide open for him, a place that he called home, and yet they rejected him. And yet, in some readings, you read where they use the word despised him. Jesus, fully human, fully divine, not welcome even in his own home, still alone. And he continues the journey. I want us to remember he loves us. He wants us to get it. And so he perseveres and he continues to teach and he continues to heal and he continues to demonstrate the power and authority that he wants us to understand that he has, that he wants us to hold fast to. And so you look throughout and then he goes to the lake of Gennesareth. And there he finds this guy named Simon. And he and Simon become pretty tight. In fact, he, rename, he names him Peter, which is the rock. And that makes sense as you look throughout Scripture. As you look throughout Scripture, Peter and Jesus' relationship, it's not always perfect. Peter often falls short, and yet God, Jesus, continues to say, come on, Peter. Come on, Peter. He's always wanting 
to teach us. He does not reject us. And so the Bible says that in verse, in chapter 5, that he gathers with uh, John and James and Peter because they have been fishing and that's their livelihood and they haven't caught anything. And so this is where they see his glory and splendor in a very different way for the first time. And he tells them, he said, go out, put your net down and something's going to happen. And you know what they said. They said exactly what we would say. Really? I've been doing this my whole life. I've been out here all day. What, what's going to happen different? And what Jesus knew that they didn't know yet is because I said so. Because with all power and authority, something different is going to happen. And lo and behold, something different did happen. They caught a multitude of fish. And Simon Peter, so overcome by it, he said, Lord, as he fell on his knees, I'm a sinner. Jesus already knew that. He knew that about them, and he knows that about us. And yet, he said, come go with me. I want you to begin to do a new thing. And so the disciples began to gather, and they followed Jesus. The next big thing that I would like to point out is as they were following Jesus, they came up on a multitude of people. I would consider about 5,000 people a multitude, right? And so as they were traveling, notice Jesus did not stay still. He moved about. Church, we are called to move about. There are people everywhere along the pathway that need to know about Jesus Christ. And so as they were moving about, they came up on this group of folk and Jesus recognized that they were hungry. Of course, he knew they, they had other needs, but he, he also knew the importance of feeding them. And so he told the disciples, I'm paraphrasing, feed the people. And the disciples, like most of us, we don't want to admit it, but I tell you, truth is good for the soul. The disciples were like, do you realize how much it's going to take? And I'm not necessarily willing to sacrifice what I have to feed all these people. They can, they can go back home. And Jesus said, no. And I believe that that same no that Jesus said then, he's saying, you can do this. With all, with all power and authority, you can do exceedingly and abundantly over that which you can imagine because of me. And oftentimes we make decisions on how we can be with and care for others based on our own limitations. And God is saying, I am here. Seek my wisdom. Seek my understanding. Now, all of this is happening before they go to the mountaintop. The thing that happens right before they go up to the mountain is incredibly profound because it gets up close and personal. Because Jesus has been teaching them about who he was and the authority and power that he has and that he is entrusting to them and to us. And Jesus sits with them in the ninth chapter of this passage and it says this and when he had called all of them together he begins to teach them something after they have fed the 5,000 after they have seen and been a part of Jesus workings in so many powerful ways he lets them know I'm not going to be with you here always. I'm going to die, but something amazing is going to happen. 
you're going to have an opportunity after this life to live forever. Now, what I want to say to us is that this is where this gets really real. Because as recent as this weekend, I have um, just been reminded that all Christians don't believe the same thing. All Christians do not believe in the healing power of Jesus Christ. All Christians do not believe in the virgin birth. All Christians do not believe that Jesus still performs miracles. All Christians don't believe in the resurrection. And so all Christians don't believe in all eternity. Now I said a whole lot. But understanding the context of the world that Jesus ministered in and the context that we live in is important to hear and reclaim the promises of God in this text. Because Jesus told them, he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross. He goes on to say, um, that in this world, you've got to be willing to sacrifice some things. He says, what prophets want to gain the whole world and lose one's soul, one's life. And so church, we've got to recognize that we have latched on to some beliefs some ways of living and doing and being that are not compatible with the word of God. And to return to God, to trust his holy word. Because he goes on to say this, is whoever is ashamed of me and my words, I'm going to take that same posture when it comes to your going before the Father. Jesus is saying a lot to the disciples there. He's saying, you all have been with me. I have demonstrated, I have been consistent, I have been intentional in teaching you all about who I am. I am God. And I have come to let you know that you will have eternal life if you believe up on me and live the way that I've called you to live, to trust me. And the word goes on to say this. It says that truly I tell you, some of you are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. God, and I can't imagine how he felt. I don't know about you, but I often want to know what God is really, really thinking. And what God knows is that there are going to be those among us, as there were those among the disciples, who are just not going to get it, who are just not going to trust him, who are just not going to take up their cross. Lord, I pray it's none of us. I pray that it's none of us. And to seal his promise in this context, he moves forward to take his original three, the three that had been with him all along, Peter and James and John, and they went up to the mountain. And Jesus began to pray. Now, I didn't say they all began to pray. Jesus began to pray. For you see, again, they were very much like us. It had been a hard day's night, and they had been work. No, that's a different place. <laughs> but they were tired, right? 
I would imagine Jesus was too. But they were sleepy. And so the Bible says they were sleepy and, and, and they slept. But get this, Jesus didn't get an attitude. Jesus prayed. He prayed for them and he was praying on our behalf today that something would be changed, that we would get who he was and what he has promised us. And so the Bible says, and, and this sermon title really could be just a glimpse of glory. Jesus was having this conversation, the Bible says, and, and you had Moses and you had Elijah. And that was symbolic. Some, some texts say that they were really there. Most texts say that this was um, a, a revealing in a supernatural way of their presence. And what I would want to say is that this was God's way of helping us to understand that heaven and earth will come together, that there is an eternity. And so in this particular passage, you have the disciples who were really sleeping, but all of a sudden they're hearing this conversation with Jesus and Moses and Elijah, and they begin to do what most of us do when we get up early in the morning and we really can't see straight. We begin to clear our, our vision, and they have this glimpse of glory. And Jesus did that for them. He has done that for us today. And we are called, Transfiguration Sunday is important and it's important for us to remember because Jesus does not want us to uh, forget as we go along life's journey and we begin to maybe separate from the, the word of God and the way of God and the will of God, you all, I'm coming back. This is not the end. And so we have an opportunity to get it right here. And so we are called to celebrate what God has done and the goodness that he is doing yet and the marvelous promise of what is yet to come. Some of y'all might be saying, that sounds really good. I want to invite you to look at a text, it's Isaiah 55, and it helps me a whole lot when I want to have all the answers. I know I'm not alone in here. There are at least two more people in here. You're yeah, right. Um, Isaiah 55 says this. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God knows that we are curious. God knows that we are people who have a need to know the answers. And so this passage didn't just pop up today. This is Old Testament, Isaiah. God is saying to the people then, as he's saying to us now, to trust him. To trust him. That he knows the outcome. To abide in him as he abides in us. I want to quote a passage from the first published African-American preacher, Vernon Johns. And Vernon Johns says this, there are more things in heaven and earth than we have dreamed in our philosophy. Meaning that we can think our way out of God, but to trust that there is more going on with God than we could ever hope or imagine to yield to God's teaching and the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Some of y'all again may say this transfiguration thing, that's, that's way out there. But I wanna tell you of something that 
I experienced. And it was supernatural, it was phenomenal, and I will never forget it. It was back in 1997, I believe it was, and I was experiencing a time of prayer. And I've learned over time that in order to really hear from God, in order to really understand uh, what God wants from me, is I've got to be quiet. I've, I've got to avail myself. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I was in a time of prayer and I remember Jesus. And Jesus was under a tree over here. And I remember going to Jesus. And I remember that was one of the greatest gifts that I had ever experienced. And over here was a voice, and I immediately knew that it was the voice of God. And I went over to have a seat at the table. And there was no physical being there, but I knew that it was God. And I began to weep. I began to weep because I began to think about who I was in the presence of God, someone who knew of God but wasn't exactly trusting God and living in the ways that I knew that his word was calling me to. And I just cried. And God said, I love you. I've always loved you. And of course, I just wept even more. Who deserves that kind of love? And so I just sat there in awe. And God and I were, was conversing. And he continued to assure me of his love for me. And he made me aware of that love that was always available and reminded me that I didn't spend enough time with him. And so after our conversation, I went back to Jesus. And as I returned to Jesus, his arms were open wide. And I stayed there a while. I remember it, y'all, like it was yesterday. And I knew then, I knew then, that God's promises were far greater than anything that I could articulate. His hope for us as human beings is far more than perhaps we are comfortable in being at peace with. But I knew that my life would never be the same. Church, God is real. And his desires for our life are beyond what we can fully comprehend. The Bible says this in 1 John 5 and 20. It says, we know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him and he is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God, and he is our eternal life. Take time to steal away to God in prayer, to be not afraid of a mountaintop experience, because we are always here, and sometimes it becomes overwhelming. Sometimes it becomes so cluttered and chaotic that we can't see, that we don't remember who God is and whose we are. May we ever be transformed into his likeness as a result of the transfiguration 
that has become our reality. May it be so. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.